looks like he's coming our way. Hopefully we can scare him away. Another day. Another day and more tasks thrown on my frickin' plate. I grabbed my uh, 200 feet of internet cable to get into this room and I grabbed enough PVC pipe to dig underground but now I gotta go out of here underground to the woodshed probably up one of those log poles across the ceiling or into the house somehow or I gotta go rent a frickin' Hilti gun and a couple of bits and drill a hole through the foundation beside where the water filtration system pumps out. <sighs> it's endless, right? Nothing can be so well, nothing's simple. You know, when you're when you're uh, your calendar's filled up, your calendar is filled up, your days are filled up. It's like, okay, I'm just gonna whip this line into the here real quick, get the internet set up here, do some live shit, save some time on editing and stuff. Oh no, no, it's not gonna be that easy that easy. <laughs> Whatever. <clears throat> so Quit the email yesterday. Um, quick mention before I get going. Um, the balls of light and the pressure, just those two items. I would be curious, and I know it would take a lot of frickin' time, and I don't think anybody's done it. I do know the people, oh, and I feel like an ass because we have somebody mapping out all the sightings and making a map for us. And I keep forgetting to email them back with the whole pile of locations that I can rattle off off my head. And I know you're watching and I will. Okay? Sorry. I apologize. But I will get to that. And uh, I know there's various other people who have done mapping of sightings of Sasquatch beings. Now, has anybody done a mapping of the bright lights or where people report feeling the pressure change and the sounds going <laughs> Now that may possibly be very interesting, right? If it would take a lot of time, I mean, especially with all the emails that I've received, just to go through them and find those details, because me being a dumbass, not knowing any better in the beginning, well, I wouldn't think that possibly in the future, after we've learned a bunch of stuff, that it may be very important to possibly save and map out where people have felt pressure change, sounds disappearing, and bright lights moving in the timber, and making a map of where that occurs and then possibly lay that out geographically on the on the crust of the planet the weather the position of the moon the stage of the moon do you know what I mean and maybe possibly link something up there and who knows if we had enough information come flowing in with all of these details from various people on the planet who knows maybe we could possibly start to better understand what the F's going on when it comes to those details and those experiences. Are they just random? Do you know what I mean? Like throwing the dice on the planet where it, where it, where it uh, pops up? Or is it absolutely connected to the electromagnetic fields of the planet? The minerals? The state of the moon? The minerals? The water? Whatever. I don't know. But it would be, it would be at this stage of the game, it would be interesting to find out, right? Um, now, as far as there being various different weird, bizarre things going on on the planet that we simple humans have a tough time wrapping our brains around. Um, who's that guy? This a guy in the southern U.S., I believe, last name Barton, I believe, and he was interviewed online, and um, he was one of these uh, classic Sasquatch Bigfoot researchers. And uh, something got a hold of him, I, I believe, spiritually, whatever it may be called. And I think, from what I understand, basically changed him as a man. Beat him down and crumbled him. Now, I think that may possibly be an example of what you may attract, what you may conjure up. I'm not saying you created it. I'm saying you opened that door. And do I believe that that is a one of typically what is around here, what people call a Sasquatch, forest person, I don't know. I have but my gut's telling me no, that wasn't, that was something else, I think, maybe, possibly. But anyways, that's a good example of some real weird shit going on, because 
I watched that interview myself, and um, we haven't heard from anyone else who's had that happen. It's not a it's not a known pattern to us yet. Do you know what I mean? Do I believe that happened to that man? Hell yeah, I do. Something happened to him for sure. But we don't have a pattern of that specific experience and results showing up yet, right? So you have to wonder what possibly our minds can do and what we can crack open right and what are we cracking open where is it where is that place that we're cracking many people are cracking open with their noggins you know what I mean all goes back to what I have been suspicious of most of my life is what is it we can really do but as we go as we go um, it's just becomes I don't know if anybody else, I'm sure there's a bunch of people out there that are on the same page I am at this stage of the game, that um, there is just so much going on that is basically our true reality, and we have been completely herded away from it, absolutely, to the point that we are almost, a, we're basically a herd of freaking cattle about as smart as pickles, not by choice, and I do not believe that we... I do believe that we can be much, much more intelligent, independent, and powerful. I do believe if we were to know of the truth of what we originally can, should, possibly be able to do, right? Anyway, there's so much more that there's a lot going on out there that we need to be aware of, and I have a funny feeling that, I mean, fair enough, we've been looking into the Sasquatch thing for quite some time, tens of thousands of eyewitnesses, Right, the majority of the eyewitnesses that report in weren't harmed, but we are hearing more and more and more about the bright lights. Right, and we've heard from the First Nations historical dropping of knowledge through the generations that they're bad. We've heard from non First Nations people say they're bad. You go after the lights, you're not going to come back. We got tons of people disappearing. I have a funny feeling that while we go on this ride of investigating what the hell is going on with these unknown beings that maybe we can start putting a little more focus on some items that just might be vital for a lot of people out there, right? So, any suggestions how or what we should do to possibly start to map out the bright lights and the pressure, the loss of, of, of hearing, if we can start focusing on those items, I have a funny feeling we're going to leap ahead and maybe save some lives, maybe, possibly right and learn a lot more and scare the shit out of ourselves along the route right now let's listen up you know it's funny this phone is smaller than the one i my one that's on the first right now i'm basically not in contact with anybody at all for a few, few days now whatever so all i got is my inbox and my emails from you all you guys and that's about it so i'm too busy and i I don't really give my phone that much attention, believe it or not, so uh, I'm not really missing it. But I do, I, it, it does grind my gears thinking about all those emails I had on there from all of you, ready to go, organized in in the notes. But anyway, so I picked up this old phone, got it charged up, and there's the notes on your previous, and they, this goes back, and it's the original one. This goes back all the way to November 30th, 2019. People emailing me. So obviously I must have, uh, it's 2019 when I started doing this. Isn't that crazy? 1920, 1, 2, 3? What? That long? We've been hanging out here doing this. That is crazy. Now let's listen to this. Dear Steve, I'm an avid hunter and I decided I wanted to take the time and share a story of what happened to me in October 2017. I really enjoy watching YouTube videos and I felt like I needed to share my story. Maybe other outdoorsmen or women have had similar experiences to mine. Feel free to share this anonymously. Gotcha, man. I was elk hunting in the Colorado backcountry, back pretty deep in the San Juan Mountains. My brother-in-law, father-in-law, and I hired a guide to set up a drop camp. This is a rifle hunt, and we would ride up on horseback, get dropped off, and hunt ourselves on a DIY trip for a week. That's a do-it-yourself trip. There is a large wall tent set up and an electrical bear repelling fence to go around a camp because the area is infested with black bears. The area we camped in was about five and a half miles 
up a very small trailhead that you have to ride in on horseback. Pretty steep country. You could do it on foot, but it would be very difficult with all your hunting gear, not to mention packing out an elk. There were no other hunters present or camping near us or in our area, surrounded by aspen groves, heavy timber, and deadfall from the timber. It is ideal elk country, and the bulls were at tail end of the rut, still bugling. There's a couple inches of icy snow on the ground from a previous storm, which, as you know better than I, makes it impossible to be silent when you're hunting stepping through the icy snow. First night, I went to bed. It was the night before the season opened. I got woken up in the middle of the night to loud branches breaking and heavy footsteps crunching in the snow coming towards our tent from above our camp, across a small creek up in the timber. I laid there thinking that a bear was coming down towards us. Whatever it was, it was very large and very heavy footed. It woke me up from a deep sleep. Once it got about 10 yards or so from our camp, I hopped out of my bed, grabbed my pistol and flashlight and yelled at my brother-in-law, wake up, there's a bear outside. We were out of the tent in seconds. Looked around, there was nothing. Nothing running off, no eye shine in the flashlight, no tracks, nothing. My brother-in-law and father-in-law thought I was crazy. This really bothered me because I had listened to this thing walk down to our camp for about 10 minutes. Night two. The next night after hunting our asses off on opening day with no elk down, we were beat tired. We all went to bed. I kid you not, in the middle of the night I'm awakened by loud footsteps crunching in the snow and branches breaking coming down towards our camp. I couldn't believe it. So this time I just laid there in the tent listening to this heavy footed thing once again coming back towards our camp. It was so loud. It was so quiet when you're in the back country, middle of nowhere. Yeah, no shit. The thing was big. I thought to myself it was a black bear. I laid there, hoping my brother-in-law or father-in-law would wake up because I did not want to scare this thing off. So this time I decided to just lay there and listen. Once it got to what sounded like the electric fence around our camp, it stopped. And it was just dead silence. I couldn't take it. I hopped out of bed, grabbed my 45, and yelled at my brother-in-law, and the bear was back. All three of us were out of the tent in seconds. Nothing. Nothing running off, no eye shine in the flashlight, no tracks anywhere. My brother-in-law and father-in-law were starting to think I was going crazy. And I was starting to question that myself. It really started to bother me because I had heard this big thing walk up to our tent two nights in a row. Night three. The very next night, after hunting all day, still no elk down, we all went to bed. I was so tired. We covered a lot of ground in some nasty country. All of us were completely exhausted. We all went to bed the third night, and this is where it gets weird. I kid you not. In the middle of the night again, I'm awoken to loud crunching footsteps, footsteps and branches breaking, coming towards our camp from the heavy timber above us. <clears throat> this time, as I'm laying there, I told myself, I'm not going to do anything, no matter what. Just listen. As I'm listening, I know whatever this is, it's super large, and it sounds like it's on two feet, based on the foot patterns that I can hear it stepping through the timber and the snow. It walked up to the fence and stopped. It was silent for about one minute. I briefly heard what I can only describe as a quick, mumbling slash gibberish like set of words. All of a sudden, the footsteps walked into two different directions. So, I knew there was two of these things. I heard one walking. I heard one walking what would be to the south of our camp along the fence perimeter, and the other footsteps are going behind me, which would be to the north, literally five to six yards from me. It got quiet again for about a minute. Now, my face slash cheek is about an inch or two from the wall of the tent, and I'm laying in my cot listening to these footsteps around us. All of a sudden, with pinpoint accuracy. A small rock was thrown right at my face and hit the side of the tent right where my cheek was, like a sniper with pinpoint accuracy. It didn't hit my face, but the inertia from the small rock was thrown with incredible precision and power, exactly where my cheek was. I'll be honest, I was terrified. In that moment, I felt so insignificant, like I was being toyed with. I laid there paralyzed. I knew now this wasn't a bear and a cub. All of a sudden, another small rock was thrown on the roof of our tent and rolled off. Then another, 
and then another in succession. I threw my flashlight at my brother-in-law to hopefully wake him up. I didn't want to say anything, so whatever it was wouldn't get spooked. The flashlight did wake up my brother-in-law. He got up just in time to hear another little rock thrown at the roof of our tent and roll off. And he said, what was that? I told him, <clears throat> something is out there throwing rocks at us. We hopped out of our cots, grabbed our pistols and flashlights, and we are all out of the tent in 10 seconds or so. Once again, nothing. We looked around for close to an hour, found no tracks, no eye shine in the dark, absolutely nothing. My brother-in-law attests to the rock he heard roll off the roof of our tent. The next morning we used a sat phone and called the guide. A big storm was moving in and there was zero elk where we were. The guide came up late in the afternoon with a packed train of horses and we left. I, I didn't flat out ask him, but I nonchalantly asked if anybody has had any weird experiences up in this canyon where we were at, and he said, well, some crazies have reported seeing a Bigfoot once or twice, why do you ask? I didn't say anything. I was just too embarrassed, so I just changed the subject. I'll tell you, that first rock thrown at me still gives me the chills, thinking about it to this day. Laying there in the pitch black listening to those footsteps <clears throat> and having a rock thrown at you with precision accuracy just doesn't make sense. When I went online and Googled, Google searched hikers, hunters having rocks thrown at them, all the results came up with individuals having Bigfoot sightings. I have no idea what it was, but hopefully I never experience that again when I'm outdoors. I'm sharing this and I wonder if any other hunters that watch your channel have had a similar experience to mine. Thanks to you for your blunt honesty and for tackling this Bigfoot topic head on. Be safe out there. Sincerely, Anonymous. There you go. Um, I don't know if this is new or I grabbed this from my old phone. So hopefully it wasn't read again, but there you go. Elk hunting, elk hunters having creepy ass experiences. And the rock throwing's been, we all know, the rock thing's been done how many times, right? It just goes hand in hand, for whatever reason. Thanks for sending that in, man. I hope you've got some more answers by now after hearing all these frickin' people on here, all these videos. Thanks for sending that in, man. I hope you've, uh, I hope you've put some some puzzle puzzle pieces together hopefully excuse me after listening to all these people on here report basically the similar same thing happening to them right you're not alone you're not alone it's common all right what do we got here how's it going brother my name is Jose Carrion I'm an, I'm a career patriot I've served over 25 years in local state and federal government and I'm a veteran, also a hunter. I've always been a field person, I've always enjoyed it. Most of my career was working in law enforcement and EMS. I can go on about my service, but that's not the point. I've never believed in Bigfoot or all this other stuff, or ever have given anything any thought at all. Just enjoyed the field. I've always been a believer in Christ, until I met someone in the church that gave me a new thought in my belief process. It made, it made sense, it also opened doors that I never would think of. I personally have never seen the Sasquatch, but I have seen other things that I don't discount exists, that I don't discount he exists. I met other agents and civilians that have seen things, and I've been with people that have denied right to my face after seeing the same thing together. People are afraid. They don't want to know the truth. Ephesians, Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and, flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So with that being said, I knew a guy that recorded a Bigfoot on a thermal camera along the U.S. slash Mexico border south of Sells, Arizona, S-E-L-L-S. -L -L he said, as he called out border patrol agents to chase this one subject running south for capture, he noticed that this person dwarfed the mesquite trees and covered an amount of terrain that no person can possibly cover in that short amount of time. He was observing from about 10 miles away and lost sight of it as it ran south towards Mexico, and I believe him. I've seen lights that quickly disappear into space, 
partner and I were giving chase to a large group of people in the San Rafael Valley around 2 a.m. and something big and human shaped swooped down at us and went straight for me. I know this because as I hit the deck and swung my M4 around, it paused and flew off. This sounds familiar. I think I got this from the earlier notes on this phone. My partner was like, what the F was that? I had no clue and I certainly knew it wasn't an owl. In the daylight hours, my partner asked me if I knew what that was and I told him I had no clue. So we just kind of shrugged it off, but I knew in my head it was something big. One night, my journeyman and I were checking a sensor activation along the border. And as we got there, my JM told me to just stay put and listen up for the follow-up sensor, and then we'll go after them. So as I sat there, the follow-up sensor hits, I look towards the area with naked eyes and noticed a light about a mile out. I grabbed the night vision goggles, NVG, and started scanning the area, but for some reason, nothing is showing on my NVGs. So I grabbed the thermal scope and I look again, but nothing. I sat there trying to figure out what's going on, and all of a sudden, this light ascends upward, very slowly, and hangs in the midnight sky and then just shoots into space. And I swear I'm not making this up. I don't think these things happen for no reason. And I know that I'm awake. I hope to not run into a Bigfoot. I'm planning a solo trip next month to look for a downed World War II aircraft in the White Mountains. And I'm now rethinking my backpacking strategy. I've never feared being alone, walking in the dark, chasing drug smugglers or traffickers. But I'm now wondering. I'm looking into buying a GPS locator and a bag of apples. <laughs> Joke, man. Often I've been in the Arizona mountains alone and I'm never afraid, but I've been in situations where I felt something watching me or telling me to get out of the area. I always follow my sixth sense. So anyway, stay safe, keep up the good work, and God bless you, and you too. And I think this was a repeat from years ago. And uh, if you go into those mountains alone to look for something, bring a dog, man. Bring a dog. They know. Man, I just wish we had the same sixth sense as the animals, don't you? Animals knowing when there's a tsunami coming. Animals knowing when there's an earthquake coming, right? Animals knowing when there's a storm coming. Animals knowing when there is something absolutely terrifying in that bush right there, and we don't, we don't know nothing, right? Dumb as a pickle compared to the canines at times with different skills. It's crazy, right? Thanks for sending that in, man. If, if this was, if you sent that in years back, you've had anything new happen, make sure you email me in again, all right? Share with us what's up. Here's one from the backyard. This is an older one, I think, that has been read, I hope. Vancouver Island, East Souk. Hey, Steve, just want to begin by saying a big thank you, man. You're a good man, keeping up your incredible work. It's about time you and some of your buddies bring this shit to light, provide those of us that have seen these things, <clears throat> excuse me, event, <clears throat> excuse me, that we never thought would be possible. As you can imagine, I'd never think in my lifetime that I'd be sharing one of my more bizarre experiences. I have had over, over my 57 years here on this planet. You may find this story totally bizarre. However, I can tell you that this is not bullshit and there are two of us that witness seeing it, the thing. I don't expect you to air this. However, if you have any information on sightings in the waterways, could you send me some info? I'd be grateful for only for any info you may have. All right, here we go. Anyhow, getting to my sighting in the ocean. My dad and I began ocean fishing in about 1969, and I fell in love with it. We were out every weekend in the spring and summer months, near East Souk on the southern Vancouver Island. I was about 14, and by this time I'd gained a lot of experience fishing with my dad since 69. We knew the area and water very well. It was March, early spring, and dad and I couldn't wait any longer to get fishing. We had a beautiful blue sky, warm spring day, and went to our usual spot for some salmon fishing. But little did we know that our day would end with such a bizarre experience. We've been trolling for a couple hours or so, and we're the only boat out there at the time. Fishing was slow, no bite yet. About mid-morning, I spotted what appeared to be a dead head 
floating towards us from a long ways away. Basically, I can see the top of the log protruding above the waterline. The thing I remember as being very odd is that the log wasn't undulating vertically as most, as most deadheads will do. This seemed to maintain height with little undulation as it drew near. We were trolling west-east, a little ways offshore, and this thing was coming toward us in a tide line running east-west off our starboard bow at approximately 2 o'clock. I'd estimate that we had been viewing it for at least a few minutes as it was getting closer as we trolled along. As it drew closer, it appeared to be a large log standing vertical just like a dead head. However, it just seemed weird how high it was protruding above the water. Now the weird part comes in, and believe me, I have goddamn goosebumps as I write this. Keeping in mind here that I never left I never left sight of it from a far distance as it drew closer, I could see it was a large log sticking up very steady, probably about two to three feet in diameter and sticking up out of the water approximately three feet. But then as it came closer to the starboard side, I noticed that it had turned and the goddamn thing had a human looking face embedded into it. It actually locked eyes with us. And I called Dad and said, look at it. What the F is that? It was a goddamn log with a human-like face in the side of it that was alive. We couldn't believe what we had seen, and within seconds, the, th the thing submerged slowly and never came up again. Needless to say, as we were shitting ourselves, as we retrieved our gear in minutes and got the app out of Dodge, we didn't want anything to do with whatever it was. I can say truthfully that Dad or myself were not impaired or on drugs during this incident. It literally scared the hides off of us. Thanks for all you do, in the name of truth. All right, that's a freaking bizarre one. And uh, you suck. <laughs> believe me, I spent many, I probably spent years fishing off East Souk. Beachy Head, I was, I was parked off Beachy Head in that flood rip, I don't know, thousands of times. Very, very knowledgeable with that coastline. What, what do you, I don't know what to say to that one. What do you guys say to that one, right? Haven't a freaking clue, don't know. It does, one thing it reminds me of though, one time my very first boat was a 15 and a half foot Hurston, just an open boat, fiberglass above the windshield, and uh, and had a 50 horse outboard on it. And I decided one time I was going to, uh, I was gonna, I was like, I'm gonna go all the way to Port Angeles to see what's up. And it was one of those absolute flat calm, bluebird days, roller, rollers, not a stitch of breeze in the water. I'm like, okay, this is the day I'm gonna do it. And I, I know I got more than halfway across. And I started feeling a little insecure. But while I was doing it, I noticed in the rollers, I just noticed something big. But it wasn't shining with a reflection like a whale. I cannot describe what it was. I don't know what it was. But I just remember seeing something big up here above the water a bit. The size of it, maybe about the size of a Volkswagen bug-ish size, if you were to picture a whole Volkswagen bug coming up out of the water, but it was, I don't know, it was, it was dark, it was black, the outside edges weren't smooth, and that's all I know. I don't know what it was, but that's how big it was. There was no wake behind it, there's no nothing, but I remember seeing it, and it disappeared between the swells, and I'm sitting there, wait, what was that? And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and it never came into view again. But that reminded me of that moment when I was about, uh, I don't know how old I was. Don't know. I was a teenager. Well, I don't know, maybe I was 20, I don't know, 19? Around there. But anyway, that is a, uh, a real nasty experience. I don't know, I can't, I have nothing I can say myself. Maybe somebody on here has had a similar experience, maybe. And they're probably a little too insecure to share it publicly. We're going to find out, right? Who knows what you might have cracked open with that one. I don't know. That is one hell of a bizarre frickin' experience, man. Bizarre experience. But you know, I have the only other time we had another guy email in duck hunting not too far from Kamloops, British Columbia on a lake in a boat with a partner and a large hairy being came up out of the water, looked at them, went back underwater, disappeared. 
I read that one. We may have even had it emailed in years back too, I think, possibly. That's a crazy ass story, man. That is a crazy ass story. Crazy. I hope it didn't stop you guys from fishing. screwed up. All this time I uh, totally forgot that I had a space heater in here preheating this little area and I forgot to turn it off. So no background sound anymore. I was too into reading. Now, who's next? From the greater operator in Saskatchewan in regards to the timber cruisers. Oh, here we go. Dear Steve and the HH family, I was the greater operator who sent in some pics. Excuse me, you also read my story about the buffalo noises I heard. As I stated in the last email, I had a bad experience the year before, but I wasn't comfortable talking about it at the time. In regards to the good share today with the Timber Cruiser, it made me think maybe I should share it if it can help others. I'm not comfortable talking about this one, but I'll let it rip. This was the experience when I nearly sold all my hunting, fishing, and camping gear. It scared me so damn bad I had nightmares for months. October 2019, I was bow hunting for that booner buck that I sent you a picture of. I wasn't going to be picky because I'm a meat eater and you can't eat horns. But he came. But if he came in, it would be a welcome sight. 20 minutes before sunset. I had a small basket buck come in and I decided I would take him. I had a nice clean heart shot with my bow and expendable at 15 yards. I was really happy as I heard him crash about 60 yards north of me on the other side of the bluff in a meadow. I know these three cores of land so well I could walk them blindfolded. I gave him 40 minutes and I went to go get my business done dressing him. I stepped out of the blind, there was a little light left, so I went to grab my bike and drag him out into the little shorter grass because the ticks were bad that fall. As I stepped out into the field line, I noticed what looked like a blue orb or craft floating about a mile away to my direct east. I was only feet away from my bike, so I slowly walked over and watched it for a minute. I thought it was a star or satellite at first. I kept my headlamp off and stood still. I knew I had to get that deer dressed soon. It was pretty warm that evening. I wanted to hop on the bike and go grab it. It was only 150 yards away, but I had re a really bad feeling about something. I can't explain the fear that came over me. The light started to move closer to me to the west. In no time, it was only maybe 100 yards from me. I literally couldn't move. Maybe it was fear. I have no real idea. But when it got to the edge of the bluff on the east side, about 100 yards away, it took a straight northwest trajectory and went straight towards my deer. By this time, every, every coyote in a five-mile area was going absolutely mental, like nothing I've ever heard. Me, still scared stiff, watched this light go to the meadow through the scrub poplar and stop. It was sitting almost exactly as to where I heard the deer fall, and then things got weirder. This light, blue light, then started dropping what I can only describe as pixie dust started falling down these two trees below the light. I snapped out of it, started the bike, and took off. I was getting the hell out of there. As I was looking behind me, I seen the light come out of the bluff and fly straight south. And then it did almost a 90 degree turn and started heading west. It was probably about three quarters of a mile south of me now. When I got the truck to the truck, I hit the ramp so damn hard, I nearly folded them. I bent the box of my truck into the back of the cab in my truck. I threw all my gear on the box like a wild man and got in. The whole time, this light is still one half to three quarters of a mile south of me. I was scared shitless because I was sitting directly over the only road in from the south. Sorry. I was scared shitless because it was sitting directly over, directly over the only road in from the south on this farm easement road. They didn't know what to do. I phoned my brother flipping out and I told him that I was scared bad. 
Not only did that, that not only that my heart was breaking because I had to leave that deer behind and it went against everything in my being. He said, just get the hell out of there until morning. I knew I wasn't safe, so I said, screw it, put the pedal, put the pedal to the floor towards that light. I headed to hit the grid road. To my surprise, it floated off to the west and then disappeared. I was an emotional wreck. I couldn't talk or drive or drink my water. I had to pull over. I was shaking so bad. When the adrenaline wore off, I thought I was going to have a half, I thought I was going to have or was having a heart attack. The next morning, I decided to drive back out there to see what the hell went down. I felt better in the daylight investigating. Isn't that weird how nighttime and daytime is such a, a threat thermometer for us as, as being human? Isn't it weird? All of us. When I got to where the lights in the trees were, there was no visible anything. I figured if anything, there was probably some radiation, but I had no way to tell. Then I found the deer. The deer had no head anywhere. No legs, just the body. The head looked to be snapped clean off from right behind the base of the skull, like it was twisted off. The reason I can tell all this is the hide was pulled off the body like a tube sock. No claw marks, no tooth marks, no hair anywhere that would indicate that the coyotes did it or where there was or were there as they should have been. No ravens or magpies, no flies. I mean nothing would go near it. By all accounts, those ribs, front and hind quarters, should have been licked up by the yotes. All four legs were snapped off at the knees. The hide was inside out. We don't have black bears, wolves, or any animals in South Central Sask Saskatchewan. They could have done that. I had the get out of here. I had the get out of here is going on bad again, and I did shortly. The only thing that was around that deer was trampled grass in a circular form. No sign of any kind of predator. It was like something ripped the hide off, sat down, ate, then left. There was no wolf or coyote kill. This was something else. I nearly quit hunting that fall. I didn't go back out for that season. I had nightmares for months. I can't explain the fear and dread I felt. I thought I was going to be one of David's episodes. I was scared for my life that night. Watching the episode today with the Timber Cruiser really hit home with me. I agree, I agree with him 100% that there's an uptick in weird, unexplainable phenomena going on. I also agree, agree that there is way more than just savvy running around. Keep your head on a swivel, and if you're going out alone, carry a GPS where someone can track you and be careful. I've had a few experiences now that rattled me, but nothing like the thought of being carried off. I don't care if people think this sounds nuts, but here's my final thoughts. That thing was either a sabbe in light form floating around, then mani manifest manifested on the deer kill, or something dropped it off. Also, my lymph nodes were swollen all over my body for two weeks after that night. I'd also agree that once you have an experience or two with these interdimensional beings or places, it's like you're tagged or followed. Time to wrap this novel up. I did get out. I did get back out there, though. I have to say thanks to you, Steve, for beating that home. I also owe a huge thanks to everyone here for sharing. The way I look at it now is, it's better to know and be less frightened if something happens. It's probably still going to scare the crap out of you, but you probably won't have a jammer. Not everyone's going to be able to sit on tree stumps in the middle of nowhere in the mountains and have a sabbe throw rocks at them while they're reading stories about people getting rocks thrown at them by a sabbe, lol. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. You're an awesome human being. Sincerely, Josh Miller. Josh, appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. I'm glad you still go out. Um, you know, on that note, quick note, for anybody curious, for, for me, like, you know, I, I uh, went steelhead fishing the day before yesterday, I think, and then whipped up a quick video, put it on the, the Hunting Angling channel. I'm going to admit it flat out. While I'm standing there, the back of me has, I don't know, 50 yards of just absolute thick, tangled log jam and willows. So I'm not overly too concerned about noises behind me, but in front of me, when I'm casting, watching my float go down the river, I'm nonstop glancing up in that timber to see if I'm noticing any shadows moving around through there.
just am. And I can't stop myself. I can still concentrate on fishing, but just so you guys know, when I'm still at fishing alone, and I am right in ground zero, many native people from the community not far from there have told me of seeing these beings basically I think the nearest sighting to where a steelhead fish that I've had sh told to me is about uh, 500 yards. Right? It's right there. There's alcohol around me. And just so you guys know about the being afraid, not going out, not doing it anymore, I still go, make sure I go, and I'll admit it, I am looking. You can't stop yourself. It's dark. I'm in big, mature trees. It's dark. It's never been logged. I'm vulnerable, I'm in the lowest point of ground, period. I have to wade up river about 100 yards and cross the river to get back and hip waders and then climb up the bank and go through timber. So it's not the fastest place to escape or to get back to, to feeling secure again with the vehicle if something decides it wants to sit and perch on the bank across from me and stare me down and watch me, <laughs> which would suck. And uh, I always say to myself, you know, I hope it doesn't happen Hope it doesn't happen because I usually go through in the pitch black because I want to be there for first light to cast. But anyway, getting back to you and your email. Absolutely appreciate you signing that in. And um, I hope that you're talking openly about it in your community with your co workers, people you know that work in, uh, in forestry or in the middle of nowhere, right? And uh, just, just square up, talk straight up. Don't be scared of talking to people and find out more, all right? Learn more. And if you learn something significant, get it to us. All right, and the uh, the hide peeled back. I told this story a couple years ago. Um, a friend of mine who seen one of the Sasquatch beings hunting above the Duffy Lake Highway, not too far from Joffrey Lakes, where another First Nation friend of mine said he won't go near Joffrey Lakes anymore because he ran into them there. Anyway, a friend of mine t had. They were also raising sheep, and a you know the classic sheep, woolly sheep, and. Uh, the ewe was an old ewe, it had died, it's like 300 pounds. Yeah, somewhere 300 pounds, 250, big thing. And he wanted, we we're going to go off somewhere do something. He wanted, he wanted me to help him load into his truck, and we're going to get rid of somewhere. It was springtime. I'm like, well, I go, let's drop it off up in this clear cut, this bench I knew of, which is above the Birkenhead River, where the Birkenhead has had more sightings than, pfft, it's ridiculous. And I'm thinking the whole time, thinking, I was just chuck it up on this open clearing. And then uh, maybe a grizzly would come and bury it or something, a military trail camera one day when we come back. And we were on our way to go, I think we are going to a wild sheep convention camera for a few days. Came back, get to my story ending quickly. Came back, and this sheep was rotten. Dead, rotten, nasty. We're talking frickin' nasty. There's a human being alive that would have interest in grabbing that sheep and eating it. Anyway. Uh, we went back up there, and it is creepy around there all the time, just because I know what's going on right there all the time. Anyway, possibly, not all the time, but pretty commonly. And uh, went to get to check out the sheep. It's gone. <laughs> gone. Not a tuft of wool on the ground. Nothing. No vehicle tracks. I put a four-wheel drive, and I wormed the truck right back into that dog shit, the clear cut area. And uh, the timber line was about 150 yards away, I think, <clears throat> the timber line. And uh, the road was back there. And there was no real underbrush growing up yet. It was that fresh of a logged off area. And this was, it was, there was one, I started doing circles around. That's what I'll typically do any time coming up on a kill that's been missing because I want to find out where the grizzly took it. So what a grizzly bear will do is they will drag it to the nearest, close to the nearest cover or into the cover and then they bury it and it look like it's been rototilled. If it's too big, too far, they'll just bury it right there. Like say up in the alpine where we're guiding sheep and stuff. If they kill a moose up there, they'll bury it right there and then they'll slink off during daylight more times than not, and they'll lay down and sleep in the bushes. Nighttime, they'll come and dig it up and feed on it. Or sometimes, if it's really remote and they're very bold, they'll just lay on top of that mound of dirt. That's what a grizzly bear does, 100% of the time. A black bear, I have seen black bears um, rip pine 
branches off of Christmas tree sized trees, rip them all off and put them on top of a, a deer carcass after I'd taken the meat off of it. Uh, four days later I went back to where I killed this huge buck in the timber, never been logged before and this black bear had covered it all up and you could see his paw prints in the snow. And um, But that's one direct first hand experience I can share with you of how I know what bears will do, black bears will do with a kill, right? And if it's big, if they're small enough they'll pick it up and drag it out somewhere and eat it. But that's what a black bear will do. They'll scrape up, put some stuff on it, try to care, try to cover it, and they'll eat it. Wolves. Wolves and packs of, say, domestic semi-wild dogs or whatever, canines, make a freaking mess of the place. There is shit everywhere. Same with the grizzly, same with the, as the black bear too. When they feed, there's stuff all over the place. There's fur, there's drag marks, there's crap everywhere from the feeding on it. It's just... You cannot not notice that one of the known predators has ate this kill, right? Wolves, it's it's annihilated. There's pieces strewn about everywhere from ground zero. Wolves do not drag carcasses away to feel secure and eat them over there. They don't do it. They shred them. They eat the skeletal remains. Typically, when they're hungry, you'll find hoofs and antlers, and sometimes the top of the skull. That's it. Um, but they make a freaking mess. Getting back to the main point of how it can relate to what you just shared, um, <clears throat> I found one piece of hide from the sheep about that big, six inches, eight inches square, square, blue. <clears throat> so one side was the wool, and the other side, I call it blue, like we would always talk about when we have to cape out, when we have to skin animals for the clients, for the taxidermy work, you have to you have to get all the flesh and all the fat off of the hide, the skin, the leather. And uh, when we're done, so uh, we'll use it as a description, we need it blue clean, make it blue. And um, when it comes to mountain sheep, when we're skinning up sheep, and it's a very tedious process, you gotta sit and camp all day long doing it. But anyways, it was blue. It's, you have to clean that hide off and make it skin perfectly blue color, nothing on it. Animals rip and shred. Hunters quickly cut it off for the night. But there was no, it did. There was no tear. Actually, I don't know if I could really tell if it was done with a blade. I don't think I could. I could say it was done with a blade, but it seemed to be a square piece, and uh, it was clean. It was absolutely clean and just laying there. <laughs> like what? It's almost. I don't think it was cut. I do not remember thinking it was cut, maybe ripped off, almost like it was like, rip, sniff, look at it, inspect it, yep, this is good, dropped it, grabbed the sheep, and took it, gone, nothing, and I did circles around that dead you, bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and wider, and wider, until I got to the edge of the timber, and I'm just looking for that one slight sign of that carcass getting carried, dragged, whatever, into the timber. Nothing. And it was all semi-soft um, dirt, ground. No vegetation either. Like footprints stood out, stood out like a sore thumb. No predators, no natural predators gone to that spot. There's nothing. And there you go. <clears throat> That's my um, semi-relation experience to what you just shared about that deer. Is really, really, really bizarre. My buddy, he didn't want to talk about it, he just wanted to leave because he still to this day does not like talking about the subject, even though he saw one broad daylight right in front of him. Doesn't want to talk about it, wishes it didn't happen, doesn't want to talk about it. Dude, he didn't want to talk about what happened to the sheep. It's like, okay, uh, let's get out. Because I started pointing out the obvious. Um, this thing was picked up, man. Something picked this up, took it. It wasn't dragged, something picked it up and took it. And then, you know, what's this? Check this shit out, right? So there you go. Pretty bizarre, isn't it? And then people say, whoever or whatever is eating it, First Nations fellow that works for, I don't know if he still does, but he worked for the band, the Mount Curry band at the time, told me that the, he had found three sets of prints, two large Sasquatch different sets along the Birkenhead River while there was rotting, disgusting, Mung, <laughs> you know when a salmon is really rotting heavy on the side of the river, it's almost like yellow pulp, just like, ugh, and the dogs will roll in it and annihilate themselves. 
And uh, he said that you could, he could see also the two sets and the smaller set. And the two larger sets were going in and out of the water. And you could see where they were picking up the mungy, disgusting, rotten salmon carcasses off the shoreline as well. And you could see where the prints went, where that disgusting salmon was. And it's not there anymore. They're taking that shit too. So they're not too picky, right? Whatever it is they are, they're not too picky. Weird, right? All right. One more, and then I got to get on with it. So after I do this, I have a uh, email from a registered nurse who wants to share something. I haven't read it yet, but it's going to be for the Rumble and the other channel, not, but not this one. But I'm going to do that right after this. This is titled "Wow, as close to one as you can get." Hey, Steve, you can call me Gar. I'm a born and raised Florida boy who lives to hunt and fish, so I've been in the outdoors more than I've ever been indoors, and even with my strange experiences. I've never had one that I could say was definitely a sabe. Once as a kid on a day hike on the Appalachian Trail with my dad and brother, something on the ridge above us was making common critter noises that concerned my dad enough to, for him to pull his Rambo-style survival knife. But he just said it's a bear or a deer. And we continued hiking without anything else happening. Anything much of it, as a ten-year-old wouldn't. The only other odd thing happened while bow hunting deer in central Florida. A moan of something I believed had to have been a sow bear in heat or calling for a cub was heading my direction, calling a few times. I prepared myself to see what this thing was, but at maybe 100 yards it started getting further, while calling twice more than nothing. Several years later I was working and living in the Newport, Virginia area, renting a room and a house there. One of the tenants and I would sit on the front porch and have drinks, just small talking and watching the sunset. He told me a story of growing up in Alabama. When he was about eight years old, he was out in the woods around this, his home and saw a sabe looking at him from behind a tree. He says he turned and started running, just went straight into a tree and fell down hurt. This thing went to him and mimicked his facial expressions he was making. The sabe then helped him up, brushed him off, and patted his ass, pushing him the way he was going. He says that night he saw it again looking in the window. If you knew this guy, you wouldn't have any reason not to believe him, so I did. A couple years later, I meet my girlfriend of now seven years. We were living in Vermont, where she was born and raised. Early on in our relationship, she, Jen, told me her strange experience with a friend one night in southern Vermont. I chalk it up to, oh, you just saw a moose. Fast forward to last year, I'm sitting in bed listening to you, and she's in the room when you read a story about the smell from these things, and she says, out of the blue, that's exactly what they smell like. So I ended up asking her about her experience again. Now though, I have now though I have her friend confirm the story and it was identical. Jen lived off of a dirt road with hay fields and woods all around like most off most of Vermont. Off the road is their driveway that goes back a quarter mile to their house. Bit of punctuation missing. After dark, Jen, her dog, and her friend T decided to go out to the field across the street to sit and watch the stars. First thing that happened were coyotes going crazy. As they do, yapping, then her dog gets nervous, so of course they start feeling uncomfortable. They start walking toward the road when several deer cross from the other side, running almost straight towards them. As they got to the road, the smell hits them. Now across the street, walking up the driveway, a bit, the dog stops and pisses itself. Jen stopped to look and see the dog. T was several steps ahead looking back at Jen and her dog. T noticed Jen looking her way in shock. Standing in front of T is a towering shadow. T looks to see what Jen is looking at and sees this figure in front of her. It takes two steps, and is into the trees and gone. Jen said at first she thought it was her mom on top of her mom's boyfriend's shoulders. That should explain how tall it was. Needless to say, they moved home a lot faster. And even though I can't say I've seen one, I believe now and definitely am more vigilant while outdoors now. On another note, we don't need the government to come out and admit anything, in my opinion. 
Because of you and others like you sharing, we can keep people aware what goes bump in the night. Most of the population wouldn't believe it if they believe it if they did unless it was standing in front of them. Thank for you do, Gar. This is for you. P.S. I found a picture and this guy looks just like you. If you want to laugh, share it. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I copied this email and saved it in my notes last night and um, obviously I had to copy the photograph. I'll share with you guys. This is a bit of a comedy chunk and I showed it to Sarah. I go, do you think this looks like me? I'm like that and she freaking lost her shit laughing her ass off. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, thanks for that email, man. Um, I'm gonna get moving. Anyways, if anybody or somebody out there, maybe somebody already has, you might, we might want to think about possibly um, somehow mapping out, taking note of where the sounds stop, where the pressure, the air pressure changes, the sounds stop, bright lights, and uh, feeling terror. But more where I think where the sound stops and the bright lights if we could possibly start mapping that out and um, see if we can't get a little headway on maybe, possibly, predicting where that might go down. If, if, if there is a way to do that, I don't know. I don't have a clue. All right? I don't have a clue. But more and more people are realizing that it is the water systems, the rivers, the river beds, granite, boulder fields, just like Dave says. Um, and another thing too, I took note of a long time ago, way before this came about, this internet stuff. After hearing my grandfather tell me about how he walked up on that thing and it didn't know my grandpa was there, right? It was squatted over a creek, walked right up on it. And I don't know how many times we've heard of people seeing these beings walking along a creek, walk along a river, standing in the water, standing in the river, and they got up on them. So there's something's going on with creeks and rivers that is the Achilles heel for the perception, the sixth sense of these beings. Not all the time, but quite commonly. That is the similar pattern, is them being in a riverbed, a creek bed, and a human walking up on them and bumping into them, spook, whoa! And they did not sense the human being there, right? That's a pattern that I realized a long time ago. And I think it was my grandfather, actually not too far, him telling me and a few other people when I'm like, all right, something's up with the creeks. Something's up with the creeks, the river, bank, the water, something's up. Something screws up their intuition when it comes to sensing our presence. Not all the time, but often, right? That's something that I've learned for sure without a doubt for me. And um, we'll see who wants to tap in on that possibly. Anyway, enough babbling. I gotta go. I got some important voices to be heard on other topics, which will be posted to the other channels as well. Share my story at howtohunt.com.